Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Perfect Pup podcast. Did you hear that perfect pup in the background? We have been blessed. With a perfect with pup. With a perfect pup bark. From Barking Annie. at the intro. That's perfect. Annie is the sweetest little dog, too. She uh, is. You've probably seen Annie on the site. Uh, Lizzie, graphic designer. She's got a little pup named Annie who is a standard poodle. She's just sweet. Good um, dog. Anyway. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about positive reinforcement. Uh, we'll take kind of a deeper dive into it and look at why it works. And then also why some of the negative types of training um, could potentially be harming your dog if you're using them. Yes, and we're also going to talk about a pup date. Pup this date. Is my fav- this is my favorite part. Yeah, I good. love these. These are fun. How about a pup date, this little pup you have on your uh, upper lip? Right so now. this was originally no done. Yeah, there's no excuses, but I, I can't. I can't get rid of it now. Also, I wake up every morning and I forget that it's there. Mm. And then I go and look in the mirror and I'm like, who is that person? Yeah. And it's me every time. Nice. It's very weird. Okay, so for today's pup dates, it's kind of similar to one we talked about a few episodes ago. Uh, but there's some studies that came out about, uh, we talked about how dogs can help your like mental well-being and help your heart health and those types of things. But there's some studies that have come out talking about how dogs in the classroom can help with the emotional well-being of students, um, their just ability to learn and even their reading skills, nice. which the reading skills one is cool. And I thought to myself, what does that mean? Uh, we'll link to the article and you should go read it. But it talks about how, you know, for a lot of kids, you know, a really good way to learn is by practicing reading out loud. Right. Yeah. And some kids get stage fright. They get nervous to read in front of their peers or even their teacher. And so some of these classrooms are having kids read to dogs. Uh, I like it. That's and it, cool. it helps build their confidence because... The dog's just going to love them no matter what, oh, whether yeah. they can read yeah. or not. Like, no judgment. They yeah. can read out loud without having to worry about it. That's cool. Yeah. So kind of a cool study. It also led me to think, you know, maybe we should just open Pupford. Maybe we should just open a school and the dogs are the teachers. Okay. Well, we'll keep it. It needs some, you know, it we needs a little bit more work. Out a little yeah. Bit. Yeah. But we'll get there. But like maybe like there's a teacher, but it's mostly just like the dog. Like, yeah. And we dress the dog up like a teacher. Okay, now we're getting yeah, somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. I wasn't on board at first, but as soon as you said the a teacher dog, outfit yeah. on the dog. With glasses, count the whole in. thing. Yep. Yeah, count okay. me in, 100%. And that's today's pup date. And all right, let's go. Let's talk about positive reinforcement. Oh, yeah. We get a lot of conversations about this, especially in the private community. That's where we base a lot of these questions from. Uh, here's the thing. Here's the thing. There's a lot of trainers out there. There's a lot of people out there who advocate for things like shock collars. Nobody calls Ch- them shock collars nowadays. Though. Oh, yeah. Everyone e-callers, calls them e-callers. Yep. Which is this very kind of roundabout way of like Same not having collar. to say shock, right? Because, <laughs> yeah. well, it's also like I went to this class way, way, way back when and they were using choke chains. Yeah. And I called it that. And they were like, oh, no, no, no. It's not a choke chain. And I was like. What? Like a pr- like, pr- like they a, said it's like a they said they called it a slip collar, okay. which sounds so much nicer. Or like a compression collar. Yeah, or, yeah, that's which, funny. It's funny because if you need to like sugarcoat the names of what you're using, it's yeah. probably a bad sign to start with. Yeah, right? for like, sure. Yeah. yeah. So we're gonna lump all of those choke chains, e collar, shock collars, prong collars. prong collars. We're gonna lump all of those into what we're just gonna refer to as punishment based or aversive training. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to talk about what science has to say about why those aren't the best way to train your dog. Uh, and just a one, you know, a couple other things about that. Yeah. So here's what's tough about negative reinforcement or, or, um, I'm totally spaced. positive punishment, positive punishment. Or yeah. what, what was the word you used a second ago? My goodness. I am totally oh, aversive, aversive yeah. methods. So here's, what's tough about aversive methods is they work. In the moment, mostly. Yeah. So if you put a shock collar on a dog and you train according to how a lot of trainers will tell you to do it, um, it's likely that it will help with the behavior to a certain extent. So you're seeing results, but the challenge with it is, is, and it's just like anything else in life. If you're getting results really, really fast from something external going in, there's a good chance that 
Um, it's probably like anything else in life and it's a quick fix and most quick fixes don't last. So don't. like a prong collar, of course it's gonna get a dog to stop pulling because it's pokey on their neck. Or a shock collar, of course it's gonna get them to stop doing whatever behavior. Or because, get their attention. Or get their attention yeah. because how do they ignore it, right? The chat, and we're gonna talk a lot today about why it's actually a problem because it is easy to fall into the trap of like, well, I'll just use an e-collar a little bit because it's gonna work. Right. And it does work and you right. get results and you're like, sweet, this trainer's awesome. They know exactly what they're talking about. Don't get me wrong, there are a lot of good trainers out there that know yep. what they're talking about, right. but they use some of these aversive methods, you know, which ends up potentially causing more problems for you and your dog than you probably realize. So that's the and big challenge with it is they work initially, right. but what uh, underlying issues are they causing is the question. And another point that you just kind of brought up in a way is what happens a lot with the use of these e-collars or the prong collars or the aversive methods is you get a trainer who I'm, I'm going to just say it right like they actually might be really skilled at using that e-collar correctly yeah because it is in itself like it takes a lot of practice for these people and they have a lot of training but what happens is you have this trainer who's telling you okay use an e-collar and they teach you for an hour during the class, like a group class, for example, or even in person. And then they say, okay, work on this during the week. And then there's this person who has so little training, so little yeah. understanding of what this e-collar is actually going to do that it they don't know how to use it correctly. And let us preface all of this or kind of reiterate that we are not proponents of these things, but we're trying no. to show the other side that you know, like you said, it can work in the moment and some people are extremely skilled with them and can maybe make it work. But we're going to talk about why you, probably everyone listening to this yeah. podcast, it's probably not the best tool for yeah. you. Well, it's we're really gonna, not. Our whole goal is to show you that you don't need those things. Exactly. Right. That's why we partnered with Zach to build the 30 day perfect pup. Right. Zach is completely 1000% on board with positive reinforcement training and the whole 30 day perfect pup, any other courses that we have or training that we talk about, it is positive reinforcement. And 100%. we are all on board with that because, oh, excuse me, because we believe, got it, um, because reverse it there. You know, you want to do that, but that's kind of the noise that you reminded me that's of. That's what I was did. hoping for yeah. in my head. It just didn't come out as good as I was thinking it, yeah, still which happens good. a lot. Yeah, that's how life just goes. Just in my life, yeah. yeah. Um, so, oh man, I totally lost my train of thought. Anyway, wait, hundred percent positive reinforcement. Oh yeah. We're, we're fully on board with that. And we feel that any of those behavioral problems that your dog is having, you could turn to a quick fix. That's an aversive method, but we believe that positive reinforcement will fix those problems as well. It might take a little more patience and it might take a little more practice, but it will work for whatever the issue is that you're having with your pup, yep. and it will be best for them long-term. We are fully committed to that, fully on board with that, and it's not just us saying that or Zach saying that, science proves that as well. Science so. and some very um, you know, professional organizations uh, throughout the United States and even in other countries as well. Um, I, I wanna read one of the statements from the AVSAB, which is the American Veterin Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior. So, I mean, just saying that, they sound really smart. They definitely know <laughs> so they more got, than you and I. If it sounds smart, they gotta be good. Exactly. No, they're, no, actually, really, they're, a, they're actually a super reputable organization. And they, and they, they have, work off of, you yeah. know, research that has been done thoroughly and, you know, scholarly articles, those types of things. So yeah, sure. here's what they say about punishment. And I think it really hits it succinctly. So I'm gonna read it word for word. It says, AVSAB's position is that punishment including choke chains, pinch collars, and electric electronic collars should not be used as a first line or early use treatment for behavior problems. This is due to the potential adverse effects, which include but are not limited to inhibition of learning, increased fear-related and aggressive behaviors, and injury to animals and people, people interacting with animals. So one thing I wanna kinda highlight there, and this is essentially what we've been trying to paint the picture for you is, they're saying it should not be used as a first line or early use treatment for behavior problems. So in most cases, if your dog is, uh, it's so hard to like put like a quantifier on it, but I would say like in the first year, for sure, I would call that early, Yeah. right? Like in the way that they're talking about it, like 
if you go to a puppy training class or something like a group class and they want to put a uh, electronic collar or a prong collar on a three month old dog, that is just so backwards. Run away from there. Yeah. Get, Run away. Yeah. get out. Cause it's going to cause problems. And, and let's, and I want to segue a little bit into what's called Lima or least intrusive, minimally aversive. So it's a kind of hierarchy of how you should go about fixing problem behaviors that your dog has. Um, so the very, very first thing, it, there's a cool little image and I'll put it in the in the notes as well. And it'll be on our website that you can look at it, but it's kind of like a car driving down a highway, right? And exit one is like the first option. And then way down at the end, you've got exit six. So exit one is, let's say for example, your dog is showing problems, right? Like they're being reactive or, you know, for example, let's even say recall or whatever it is. The very, very first step before you even look at training is to look at their, their wellness, just like their overall nutrition, their physical health. Like, are they healthy? Because some dogs, they're not going to be able to listen. They're not going to be able to focus. They're not going to be able to really even pay attention to you until they're healthy. If they're, you know, fighting off a toothache, like that might be bugging them so bad that they're not even going to be able to listen to you when you're talking. Mm -hmm. So that's step number one to fixing problem behaviors or exit one, if we wanna go with that analogy of driving down the freeway. And exit two is what they call antecedent arrangements. So this is kind of like taking your dog out of a potential situation. So being proactive and knowing like, okay, if my dog is very bad with, bad with children or they have issues behaving around children, you're gonna take the extra steps to not have that happen while you're working on the training. So yeah. before you even step into any training methods, Number one is, you know, make sure your dog's feeling fine. And number two is, as you're working on the training, keep them away from these things that are going to potentially cause these problem behaviors. Like, for example, we talk about it all the time about controlling, controlling the environment. environment. Yeah. yeah, like if your, dog, if, you, if your dog won't stop digging, they shouldn't have free reign in the backyard because yeah. they're just going to continue to dig. It's not going to disappear if you just leave them out there and hope that yeah. it, they're going to read well, your mind. Well, that's, right? an important, that's an important part of training generally. If your dog has problem behaviors... A lot of people, old school thought said like, oh, if my dog poops in the house, for example, and right. I find it three hours later, yep. if I go rub my dog's nose in the poop, they're going to understand, oh, I shouldn't have pooped. It doesn't work like that. If you if you aren't able to help your dog fix a behavior the moment that it's happening, then you're not going to be able to fix that behavior because yep. dogs don't have the same ability to think back and that realization of realizing like, oh, that thing I did three days ago was a bad thing. They don't have the same like moral compass or conscience well, that and you humans do. They don't understand and, the like the language like speaking right, to us because right. if I came to you and said, hey, that thing you did three days ago, yeah. it bothered me. You could say, oh yeah, I remember that. But yeah. you can't have that type of conversation no. with a dog. It has yeah. to be instant. So that's why with a lot of these behaviors, like if you need to be watching, like digging. Right. If right. you are not out there with your dog when they're digging and you're trying to teach them not to dig by going over and showing them the hole and saying, hey, don't do that, right. then they will never, ever understand. It's the same thing with counter surfing. It's the same thing with any other issue that they have. If you don't catch it in the moment and help them understand, okay, that exact behavior is getting rewarded or not rewarded, then you're going to have a hard time teaching them. So 100%. anyway, sorry for that. No, tangent, I, but. I think that's a perfect thing to add. Um, so after those two steps, the next one is positive reinforcement. And the way I look at these things is you should stay on this kind of step of the Lima hierarchy of, of kind of training your dog. You should be on it for an extended period of time. It's not, oh, I tried positive reinforcement for a day or two for a couple training sessions and it didn't work. Like I'm gonna move on to the next step. Like that's not how it works. It takes time, patience and consistency. Um, and so positive reinforcement is kind of the next step. And then the one after that is differential reinforcement of alternate behaviors. So for example, um, like if your dog is chewing on something, you redirect to something that you want them to do and then you reinforce that behavior. That's kind of a general example. Yeah. And then even beyond that, you have extinction, negative reinforcement and negative punishment. And then even one step further than that is positive fun positive punishment. So what we are being told by the experts and by the you know organizations and groups who have been doing this for so, so long and doing the studies and doing the research, they're saying positive punishment, meaning hitting your dog or yanking them on like a like a choke chain or using a shock. That is the last step that you should be trying to use. 
to train your dog. Not the first, yeah. not, oh, I'll just use this for now and then eventually not have to use it anymore. Like it should be the very, 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 very last thing that you opt for. And unfortunately, a lot of people opt for it. Yeah, so at fast. the beginning. So fast. It's unfortunate. So, for sure. So here's one of the reasons why something like shot collar is, or a prong collar or choke chain or whatever else is not a good idea. So um, there, we'll uh, post this in the show notes as well, but there is a study that's being done showing two different training methods. I'm gonna read this to you so that I don't uh, yeah. botch the verbiage here. It says, good. the present exploratory study aims to compare the effects of two training methods on both the behavior welfare of the dog and the dog owner relationship. The first method is based on positive reinforcement, um, so the appearance of an appetitive stimulus, um, whereas the second method is based on negative reinforcement, disappearance of an aversive stimulus. The so this would still under fall under, it's not technically positive punishment, but it would still fall under aversive training methods. Yeah, so shocks, choke, collar, prong, stuff well, like that. Yeah, and a lot, in this case, the negative reinforcement, it's, you know, taking away a, a bad thing, but right. yeah. Continue. Yeah, yeah, so it says, the study compared behaviors linked to signs of stress and attentive behaviors toward the owner in two dog training schools, which use different methods. Walking on leash activity and obeying the sit command were studied. So they just study those two things, walking on leash and obeying the sit command. The results show that dogs from the school using a negative reinforcement based method demonstrated lowered body postures and signals of stress. And that's how dogs communicate, right. body postures, right? right? The tail, the legs, the hair on the back. Sometimes even kind of hunching down. Hunching, yeah. whatever else. So the, so the negative reinforcement based method demonstrated lowered body postures and signals of stress, whereas dogs from the school using a positive reinforcement-based method showed increased attentiveness toward their owner. So the positive reinforcement school, the completely separate areas, that's the one where the dog showed more attentiveness and less stress signals. And if, if you've been around your own dog or have studied other dogs or understand dogs at all, when a dog is more stressed, they're more likely to chew, to act up, to bite, to be aggressive, to do all of these different things. It's not a good, too much stress Stress is not good for mental health and yep. prolonged exposure to too much stress can cause um, a lot of mental health issues. Yeah. So that what this study is saying is the positive reinforcement caused less of that stress the dogs are more con confident. They paid more attention to the owners. Well, and think about yourself even like as, you know, when you're in a situation, this is why a lot of people are really bad at test taking, right? They understand the material, but it's stressful for them. And mm -hmm. when they get stressed out, their mind starts to shut down. They can't reason as well as they should. They don't, they just don't know what's being asked. Like that's human yeah. example, right? But yeah. the same thing happens with our dogs. If you've been around your dog and you've seen when they're really, really stressed out, it's extremely difficult to get their attention. It's extremely difficult to communicate with them. And that in itself, the fact that the study is showing that positive reinforcement shows increased attentiveness, that's what we're looking for. Like yeah. that is the end, not the end goal, but that is like the name no, of the game. You want attentiveness. Yeah. If your dog is paying attention to you, you can train and you can yep. communicate. You if, can tell them yep. what needs to happen next to avoid this or do that. Like if they, if you can't get their attention, it means nothing. Like we talk about that so much, you know, because we sell dog treats and they help with, you know, capturing attention. But like, that's not, those aren't just words. It's not just something to like talk about. That is how you communicate with your dog yeah. is getting their attention, directing them from there. Yeah. And, and to me, that shows a lot. Like if, if you're, if you have less attention because you're using an aversive mess, method like a shot collar, yep. that makes you more and more and more reliant on that to train your dog basically, yeah. right? Because if you're using positive reinforcement methods and your dog is paying attention to you, then you're building a strong bond there where you don't have to insert anything else in there other than treats maybe yep. to, to reaffirm that attention bond that you have. Whereas if you use the negative or aversive methods, you become more and more reliant on those methods. Like you, in order to get your dog to continue to um, comply to requests that you make from them, you're going to have to have a shot collar or if you or you're going to continue to have to have a shot collar or even yep. if you reduce that down and you use just a beep, you're reliant on the beep of the collar right. to help your dog continue to understand and pay attention to you. And what happens when you don't have it? Yeah. What happens when you go somewhere and, oh, I don't have my choke chain or, oh, I don't have my 
electronic collar. Like, yeah. is your dog going to listen to you? And that, and that for me, like, cause I, I think everyone's at a different kind of like point in their, I guess, like belief in dog training, right? Like some mm -hmm. people are like so full on positive reinforcement only. Some people are like, oh, I'll do this or that from time to time. And no matter where you are, like what kind of clicked for me was just, I want my dog, I want to have a level of communication with my dog and I want my dog to want to listen to me yeah. in all situations, Yeah. no matter sure. like what tool I'm using. Like, and that's why, you know, these things are so, you know, they're referred to as tools, but like the most powerful tool that you have is like your ability to communicate with your dog. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the studies show that when you're using aversive methods, you're breaking down the communication and losing your trust with your dog. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk about one more um, study that was done here. I think, I think this one's really interesting because it kind of, I don't know, this one hit home a little bit more for me. Again, I'm going to read the whole thing just because it's powerful. This will probably be one of the last kind of studies we talk about, but, um, so essentially they took 53 owners and surveyed them about their training methods of seven common tasks and then filmed the pup parent and the dogs interacting in a series of standardized scenarios. Um, dogs owned by subject who who reported using a higher proportion of punishment were less likely to interact with a stranger and those dogs whose owners favored physical punishment tended to be less playful. However, dogs whose owners reported using more rewards tended to perform better in a novel training task. Ability at this novel task was also higher in dogs belonging to, those, to owners who were seen to be more playful and employed a patient approach to training. This study shows clear links between a dog's current behavior and its owner's reported training history, as well as the owner's present behavior. High levels of punishment may thus have adverse, adverse effects upon a dog's behavior, whilst reward-based training may improve a dog's subsequent ability to learn. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get more black and white than that, right? Like, right. And, and the thing that just kind of honestly makes me really sad in this is like, the study showing that the more punishment was used, the less playful the dogs were. Yeah. And like, that's, I think for most people, I can speak for myself and probably for you as well, in a sense, like you get a dog cause you want to have awesome experiences with them. You want to take them out. You want to go on hikes. You want them to, you know, play with your kids. You want to like go play fetch with them in the backyard and like yeah. have fun interaction with your dog and have them be like playful and, and enjoying being around humans, being around you, being around your family. Yeah. And, and just to think like, man, I, it just makes you want to avoid punishment because if that's going to make your dog less playful, like, uh, it's yeah. just, yeah. Well, in addition to that, a, a big part of that too, that stuck out to me was that, um, they're less likely to, um, approach strangers or be okay with strangers. And right. on the surface, it's like, well, I don't know how bad I want my dog to go approach strangers, but right. the underlying piece of that is if your dog is less comfortable with strangers, it's more likely yeah. that your dog has the potential to, um, be aggressive with a stranger to react, or, or yep. to react and bite or, yep. or chase or things like that. So yeah. that's what kind of stuck out to me with that as well. But. Yeah. Agreed. And, and that's, there's a couple other studies. We'll link to a few more in the show notes that you can go look at for yourself. But, yeah. um, what, that's one of the other really kind of outstanding results of, of these studies is that, um, the punishment, the, the aversive, the, the pain-based techniques, they cause aggression in dogs. Like yeah. there are multiple studies that it is a direct causation. It's not just correlation. It is a causation of using physical force against your dog, like makes them tend to react with physical force. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's same thing with humans, right? Like yeah. violence begets violence. Like I know that's kind of a harsh way to think about it, but in reality, that's kind of what's happening. So yeah. like Mike said earlier, I mean, our goal the whole reason we wanted to do this, it's not to shame people who do these things. It's not to say, what the heck are you doing? You're ruining your dog. It's, it's, that's not my goal. That's no. not our goal. Our goal is to have a healthy conversation about it and say, look, you know, this is what science is saying. This is what studies are showing because we just want you to have a better relationship with your dog. And, you know, science has shown us, our own experiences have shown us, so many people around us have shown us that using the positive reinforcement based training techniques is going to help you have that healthier, longer lasting, happier relationship with your dog. And ultimately just what you probably set out for when you got your dog to begin with was to have that happy, healthy relationship with them. Oh yeah. And part of the um, reason behind talking about it as well is that there are a lot of people out there, especially if it's the first time you've ever had a dog and you're wondering, 
what in the world am I supposed to do? Yeah. You're going to have a lot of people that come yep. and say, well, you need a shock collar or you yep. need a choke chain or you need a prong collar. Or you need something like that. Or your dog's pulling on a leash. Well, you need a prong collar right. or, you know, whatever the other suggestions might be. And especially if you're a first time dog owner, you may not know any different. It's true. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, there were things like with, with Doris. Yeah. When we first got Doris years back, yeah. we had no idea. And, and what you were, were probably that? told, yeah, when, when she pees on the ground, put her nose in do it this and yell and no. Yeah. yeah. And we didn't, yeah. we didn't know any different, right. but, um, yeah, so it's, it's, a there is a lot of information out there that's potentially, um, harmful to your dog, even if it doesn't seem like right. it's causing a bunch of issues right then, uh, there's the potential it's causing a lot of, um, underlying issues as well. And not just the potential, like we're seeing it in studies, <laughs> yeah. like yeah. it is happening. Yep. So yeah, and like Devin said, we're not we're not trying to shame, we're not trying to do anything else. It's more like, hey, we just want to show that there is a better way yep. to do it. And this way is going to work better in the long run. I think yeah. just one kind of final thing to reiterate is like Mike talked about earlier, you might get a quick fix with using aversive methods, but unfortunately, just like everything in life, quick fixes almost never last. And yep. they often cause larger problems in the long run. You know, if if your house is falling down and you duct tape it up, it might stay for a, a couple of weeks, but then, you know, the next time a storm comes, like the house is going to fall down. You're going to have yep. people in a potentially like extreme example there. Right, right? right. But that's just how it is. Short-term fixes, they just, they don't work and they don't, yeah, they just, they're not going to help your dog in the long run. So yep. we hope you enjoyed this episode. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe there, leave us a comment. We love interacting with you guys. You know, let us know if there's an episode you want to hear. We, we pull a lot of this stuff just from the general conversations we hear in the community. Yeah. But you know, if you email us and say, Hey, I heard this or that, or I'd love to hear an episode about this. Like we're, we are all for it. We, oh, yeah. you know, we love interacting with you guys as a community and just, you know, as, as an audience here listening to the podcast and, you know, we want to keep, keep hearing from you guys. So yeah, for sure. But thanks for listening and we will uh, talk to you next time. See you guys. See ya. Thank you. Yeah.